I'd like to introduce Mike Frank, who will be introducing our keynote speaker. Michael Frank is the Hoover Institution's Director of DC Programs, where he oversees research and outreach initiatives. He also holds a dual appointment as a research fellow. Mike Frank is a longtime veteran of Washington, DC policymaking. Prior to joining Hoover, Frank served as a policy director and counsel for House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. He also served as the Vice President of Government Relations for the Heritage Foundation from 1997 to 2013. During this time, he managed all the think tanks outreach with Capitol Hill and the executive branch. Frank also completed a tour of duty as communications director for former House Majority Leader Dick Armey and worked for U.S. Department of Education and the Office of National Drug Control Policy. He has been quoted widely in the print and broadcast media and was a regular contributor to the National Review Online and other publications. Frank got his undergraduate degree from Yale University before earning his JD at Georgetown. He is now a member of the Buckley Program's Board of Directors, and we are pleased to have him back here in New Haven today. With that, please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Mike Frank. Well, first of all, let me um, thank every single one of you for being here tonight. As someone who has um, been excited about the whole concept of the Buckley Program from its inception, and meeting uh, Lauren, I think, before we actually created it and talking about what it might achieve. I just have to say that uh, as a member of the board, but also as a, uh, an observer, I've been continually uh, impressed and amazed at how Lauren and the increasing number of fellows, uh, undergraduates and graduate students alike, have taken the Buckley program to where it is today. So it's very unique. Uh, it's very valuable. Believe me, in the scheme of things, to have this uh, opportunity for undergraduates to hear these programs. Um, and I'll say one thing, which you, a couple of you may have heard a, a year or two ago when I introduced Senator Sass. As a member of the board, we all have, you know, to ask ourselves at some point, what does victory look like? And for me, uh, victory being on the Buckley Program Board is that we sit around one year and have our board meeting and someone reports that the Yale Board of Trustees has just met. And in the meeting, someone of the board pulls out a program, kind of like the one you have in front of you from today, and is looking at it and saying, this is a remarkably high quality, intellectually challenging, and just absolutely superb program. And it's being done by a 501c3 created by a group of our alums who are doing something that Yale, as an institution of higher education, should be doing automatically. And I move as the Yale Board of Trustees to suddenly do all these kinds of things that the Buckley program is doing, and we're no longer needed. That's my de definition of victory. May not come for a long time, but it's something to look forward to, because I think what we're doing is exactly what any major university should be doing, and I'm very proud of it. And Lauren, you and, and the 280 plus fellows, it's remarkable. I just really want to tip my hat and give you another round of applause, please. So it's my privilege tonight to introduce the keynote speaker, uh, Senator Kelly Ayotte, who used to be senator from New Hampshire. She's here with us, and we're really honored to have her. A couple of quick things about Senator Ayotte. She, um, uh, was background educationally, Penn State undergrad, Villanova law degree. Uh, she's uh, never thought she was going to do what she subsequently did. She ended up becoming a prosecutor. She ca uh, dealt with some capital cases. She got into the Attorney General's office in New Hampshire. She became the State Attorney General for a number of years, subsequently ran for the U.S. Senate in 2010, uh, and she lost a very tight election, unfortunately. And I think I can say that with no problem here tonight, unfortunately, in uh, 2016. While in Congress, while in the Senate, she served on the Armed Services Committee, the Budget Committee, a couple of other committees. Her, if you think about if she asked ask her what she was most proud of what doing when she was there legislatively, it relates to her work on some of the national security issues. Uh, she's a great proponent of limited government, of less spending, of really solid tax reform 
uh, a whole range of things that I think we all would agree on. Uh, but tonight she's here to talk to us about the topic at hand, the course, the Constitution. Uh, Senator, come on up and join us. And please give me a round of applause. Well, Mike, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And um, I, I have to say, Lauren, incredible what you've done to found this and to see it succeed. And I think this is only going to continue to grow. Uh, what I'd like to say to your fellows that are here tonight, please run for office. We need you. <laughs> and I, I, I'm actually up here to tell you that I didn't come from a political family. I didn't come from a wealthy family. I actually had no particular plans to run for office, and you too can do it. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart, though, I will tell you that. Uh, I am truly honored, though, to have been invited to be here uh, for this program that obviously is the annual conference in honor of William F. Buckley. And I also want to thank Senator Buckley for his service to our country. Uh, incredible. Thank you. And, you know, it's also incredible that he got elected on the conservative ticket. Uh, you know, could we see that happen again? And it really is a wonderful thing to think that, that something like that could happen in our country on the merits. So. Uh, Kudos to you and, and thank you. I, I think the, this program, when I, I look at what's happening across the country on our college campuses, and unfortunately what's happening are too many examples where on college campuses it's extremely hostile to different viewpoints, to conservative viewpoints, and sometimes those viewpoints, frankly, often those viewpoints are completely shut out. So the niche that the William F. Buckley program serves is incredibly important so that we can have diverse discussion on our college campuses. And I, I, I can't quite figure out, if you can't have a diverse discussion and have a disagreement on a college campus about ideas, where are we going to do this in our country? So I thank you for providing those alternative viewpoints at Yale and beyond Yale, because I know your impact is beyond Yale. And to quote William F. Buckley, who once joked, liberals claim to want to give a hearing to other views, but when they're, sh they're shocked to discover that there really are other views. <laughs> so thank you for presenting those other views. Now, I know you heard from some phenomenal legal minds uh, during the seminars today, including uh, Jonathan Turley and m many others in this room who are experts on the Constitution. So I'm not even going to attempt to render the type of in-depth legal analysis uh, that you heard this afternoon. There actually was a point in my career when I was a real lawyer, and I was a murder prosecutor and at one point a state attorney general where I even argued a case before the United States Supreme Court. Um, you can look it up. It's called AOT versus Planned Parenthood. They're real fans of mine. Um, <laughs> so, he so here's my confession tonight. I got a call in late January from the Trump administration, and they asked me to be the so-called Sherpa for Justice Neil Gorsuch to help him through the Senate confirmation process. And as I've told you, at one point I was a real lawyer, so this caused me to actually have to brush up on my constitutional law, some of which I had uh, gone back to first year law school. And some of you may actually know my history with President Trump, because during the election, when the Hollywood Access tapes came out, uh, this was really an issue for me. And I didn't vote for him. I wrote in Vice President Pence. And if you have followed anything about the president, he typically doesn't forget these things. 
So you can imagine my surprise uh, when the Trump administration called me in late January and asked me to uh, really be a, a shepherd for their Supreme Court nominee. It was a very easy decision for me uh, to say yes because Justice Neil Gorsuch is extraordinarily qualified and he is and will continue to be an exceptional Supreme Court Justice. Uh, more importantly, I knew what was at stake for the country and for the Supreme Court and how important who serves on the Supreme Court would not only be important to me, uh, but I happen to have two children and what this will do for the country and all of our constitutional rights. Plus, I will tell you that having run for office in 2016 during my reelection campaign, uh, I took the position that we should hold this position open until the presidential election occurred. And uh, that was not without some criticism. <laughs> Thank you. And you can imagine myself and some of the other senators that were up for re-election in 2016, uh, there were quite a few barbs that were thrown over that. In fact, I'm pretty sure that every editorial page in my state, with the exception of the conservative union leader, wrote many more times, more than once, uh, about what I was doing and holding the Supreme Court position vacant. Uh, but there is one person I do actually want to mention tonight uh, when it comes to having had the opportunity to have Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court because lately he's had, he's had a tough time. And, and that is Senate Majority Leader Mitch, Con Mitch McConnell. Because no matter, I'm, a I'm, actually, I'm actually glad to hear some claps in the room for this because no matter what Steve Bannon thinks of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, on this issue, you have to give him credit. He was really the architect to say as Senate leader at the time, we're going to wait till the presidential election. We're going to let, we're in a presidential election year. We're going to let the people uh, weigh in on this election, and then we'll let the chips fall where they may. And it's not easy to keep a Republican caucus together uh, when there are many tough elections like my own throughout the country, and we're being attacked on this very issue. I point this out because the media was clearly against this position as Republicans of waiting for the election to allow this appointment to go forward. Whoever got elected was, I mean, if Hillary Clinton had gotten elected, she would have been able to obviously nominate someone to the Supreme Court as well. Uh, but I, I couldn't be happier that we took that position because the balance of the court was at issue. And this is particularly important when we think about the loss of Justice Scalia and the impact that he had on that court as a conservative, as an intellectual. Uh, so having spent nearly three months with Justice Gorsuch during the confirmation process and seeing how he now conducts himself on the Supreme Court, I'm very proud to know him and I'm confident that he's gonna enforce our constitution and our laws as they're written and not legislate from the bench. He also happens to be an excellent writer he writes crisply and clearly. He communicates in a way that you can understand the law and so that average people can understand what he is saying. I think that's going to allow him to be particularly persuasive on the court and to have a very big impact going forward. Uh, during the confirmation process, he was fond of telling us about how Sister Rose Margaret taught him how to diagram a sentence. So uh, he very much is, diagrams his sentences. The other thing that he told us quite frequently, and I think this is telling, he said, it's also that it's not what you say, but how you say it that attracts people to your cause. And I, I will not forget that because there is a lot of wisdom in that statement. Sometimes we can hear an idea that perhaps ideologically we're aligned to but how is it that's presented to us? And I think that's really important as we think about bringing people to the conservative cause. And so on a personal level, I got to know him as well. Um, not only is he a brilliant, caring man, but I, I kind of like the outdoors, so 
he, he like me, he likes to ski, he, uh, he's a runner, uh, he's, he's someone who at 50 years old, I can tell you he's quite healthy, so he's going to be on the Supreme Court, I think, for a, for a long while. You're probably also wondering about the title of Sherpa, right? I mean, I, I wondered about this title when I, when I got it. I mean, I knew when I was elected a senator what that meant, right? But I was trying to explain to my kids, why am I now again spending three months in Washington after having lost an election and now my title is Sherpa? So, uh, but you know how partisan politics are in Washington. The Sherpas, they, they bring people and they guide them up into the Himalayan mountains, up to the thin air. And so I guess there is some analogy when it comes to the partisan politics in Washington. Uh, but really my job as a Sherpa was to bring him around uh, to the Senate and to bring him into members of both sides of the aisle for the meetings and then also to be part of the preparation of helping him prepare uh, for the very long judiciary hearings. And I think there's a few folks in this room who also helped with that process. So I want to thank you. And we did over 70 meetings on the Hill, right? And so having lost my election and then having going back into these Senate offices, it was, it was a little odd seeing it from the other end and so suddenly. Uh, but, but one of the things I realized looking from the outside in is we, we met with people from such an ideological range, right? So we had meetings with Bernie Sanders and Chuck Schumer. And then of course we had meetings with you know, Mike Lee and Ted Cruz and sort of everyone in between. And you know, I'll never forget we're in the meeting with Bernie Sanders and I, I mean, we couldn't get in a word edgewise. I mean, and, and all he would start talking about is, what do you think about the president's, what he's saying about voter fraud? You know, do you think that there's any truth to it? I just have to know Justice Gorsuch. And, and he'd just go on and on. And so, so and, we, and Justice Gorsuch has never had to answer a question. It was great. But, uh, you know, so, so that was kind of fun seeing that from the other side. And then, of course, there was the meeting with Chuck Schumer. So you walk in with here's the president's Supreme Court nominee into the minority leader's office. And uh, so Chuck Schumer proceeds to ask Justice Gorsuch every question that he knows he can't answer, right? So the first question out of his mouth is, so do you think that the president's Muslim ban is unconstitutional? And then the next one is, well, do you think that Bush versus Gore was rightly decided? And you know, he's going on and on, and you can see the litany of questions from Roe versus Wade down, you know, down to uh, our, uh, Heller. And, and so Justice Gorsuch is, is very incredibly bright, uh, trying to answer as best as he can within the law without with really without violating his judicial ethics. Bear in mind, he's still a, a sitting judge on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, so he can't render opinions on things that may even come before him on that court. And so then we realized as we're walking out of the meeting that, that really Senator Schumer's only purpose was to go out and have a press conference, you know how much he loves the cameras, and, and tell everyone, well, he wouldn't answer any of my questions. So, uh, so this was kind of a baptism by fire for Justice Gorsuch. I was used to that as a senator, uh, but, but having spent 10 years on the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, you can imagine he was used to more logical arguments. Uh, when he was talking with his colleagues uh, on the bench. Now, the contrast on the other end, of course, is uh, people like Senator Mike Lee and many of the Republicans that we met with, uh, that I served with, that, that were fun. And I have to tell you, and I, I, I don't think he'd mind me telling you this, when Justice Gorsuch went into Senator Lee's office, you would have thought that Mike Lee met the biggest rock star that he could have ever met in his life. I mean, it, it was a moment. And, and you could imagine, Mike, Mike himself clerked for Ju uh, Justice Alito when he was on the Circuit Court of Appeals. And he obviously has a lot of depth and knowledge of constitutional law. Uh, you know, he himself, of, of many senators that serve, really follows the law in this area. So we went from sort of the Chuck Schumer end to the love fest between, you know, Senator Lee and and uh, Justice Gorsuch, who had a lot in common when, when it came to talking about constitutional law. It probably won't surprise you that in the confirmation process, just like you see in the hearings, 
that many of the questions of the Democrats centered around specific cases that you wouldn't be surprised about, whether it was Roe versus Wade, Citizens United, the Heller decision. But there's one area that I was very perplexed about that they focused on in the confirmation process, and that was the area having to do with Chevron deference. Now, I know you had a seminar this afternoon on administrative law, and the reason this puzzled me a little bit is that Justice Gorsuch in the Tenth Circuit wrote a, a, an opinion, Gutierrez, where he was very critical of Chevron deference. And the Chevron doctrine requires federal courts to defer to administrative agencies' interpretations of the law where they can find some ambiguity and it is a reasonable interpretation, obviously a very broad term. Justice Gorsuch has actually called it a judge-made doctrine for the abdication of judicial duty. Uh, the, the end result of Chevron deference is, of course, it gives immense discretion to the executive branch. And in fact, the executive branch administrative agencies, and it raises many serious separation of powers issues. Uh, but the bottom line is the doctrine benefits whoever is in the executive branch and controls the executive branch. So I never quite understood. They gave Justice Gorsuch a really hard time, the Democrats, on this issue. And they never seemed, despite how many times he would mention it to them, uh, it would always surprise me that they didn't quite get the association that Justice Gorsuch would be skeptical no matter who was president when coming, when it came to the Chevron deference issue. Uh, because, and so now you have a Republican president, and if you're deferring to all of their interpretations of the law and you're a Democrat, you might kind of you might kind of like his position on Chevron. Uh, so I always thought that was a little puzzling why they decided to take the position they did on that. On the whole, Justice Gorsuch actually had some terrific meetings with Democrats. I mean, we had some very productive meetings where I think he answered their questions. They had a great back and forth, uh, but it became very clear early on uh, that we were not going to be able to get over the 60 vote threshold because they had a base that was very upset uh, with the election. Uh, they had a base that weren't, wasn't going to allow them to vote uh, for anyone that President Trump nominated. Um, they were still very upset about Merrick Garland's nomination. And so despite good productive meetings, uh, we, we became, it became apparent pretty quickly that they were gonna filibuster, unfortunately, Justice Gorsuch's nomination. And those of you who have followed the history of this, of course, I, I was in the Senate at the time when Harry Reid in 2013 actually changed the Senate rules for lower court judges, so for Circuit Court of Appeals and District Court judges, and really why they did it at the time was because President Obama wanted to pack the 10th, excuse me, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals with judges that would be friendly to his administrative regulations, which as you know, he issued a mountain of them while he was in office. And so that precedent really set, uh, I, I would say in motion, what happened when the Republicans were really left with no choice. Either don't confirm a Trump nominee to the Supreme Court or change the rules uh, for the Supreme Court, which is what they did. So Justice Gorsuch, of course, was confirmed. Uh, there were three Democrats that voted for him. And so he, he was, you know, n did not get the, the, the 60 vote threshold. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that the Democrats are not going to like this if the president gets another nomination to the Supreme Court, which could happen uh, during his time in office. Thinking about Justice Gorsuch coming into this uh, forum, I was thinking about William F. Buckley. I think he would have been very pleased with Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch and his philosophy. Uh, Buckley said that he didn't want the Supreme Court quote, to continue to perform as a standing constitutional convention. I can't help but think that he would have appreciated Justice Gorsuch's focus on the actual text of the Constitution. And to Justice Gorsuch's own words, 
in how he defines originalism. Uh, he, he says, as the idea, when it comes to originalism, as the idea that when interpreting the Constitution, we should look to the history, to what the document would have been understood to mean to the members at the time of the ratification. It seems like common sense, though, really, when you think about why wouldn't we want to know when we're interpreting the Constitution. As a former senator, for me, it's refreshing that Justice Gorsuch believes that the separation of powers is the genius of the Constitution, and that in his words, quote, it is the job of the judge to apply, not amend the law passed by the legislative branch, even though he may prefer a different outcome himself. And he has been true to those principles during his first term on the Supreme Court. Uh, this is something that in the confirmation process he talked about quite frequently and, and in the meetings he had with senators. In his first majority opinion for the court, kind of on an issue that was a mundane issue in many ways, uh, his court opinion was about how do you, the question of whether individuals who purchase debts are considered debt collectors under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Not really a page turner, right? Uh, but this was his first majority opinion. But I want to share what is a somewhat lengthy passage from it because I think it really, really goes to what you can expect from him in terms of his philosophy. And that is, in the opinion Justice Gorsuch wrote, and while it is, of course, our job to apply faithfully the law Congress has written, it is never our job to rewrite a constitutionally valid statutory text under the banner of speculation about what Congress might have done had it faced a question that on everyone's account it never faced. Indeed, it is quite mistaken to assume, as petitioners would have us, that whatever might appear to further the statute's primary objective must be the law. Legislation expressed in statutory terms, often the price of passage, and no statute yet known pursues its stated purpose at all costs. For these reasons and more besides, we will not presume with petitioners that any result consistent with their account of the statute's overarching goal must be the law but will presume more modestly instead that the legislature says what it means and means what it says. Think about that, hearing that as an average person. Something so simple that interpreting a statute that the legislature might say what it means and mean what it says. It makes so much sense that the court should not speculate about what they think Congress intended or make up the law to fit the result that they want in a case, or even maybe the best result in the case. But yet we have seen this time and time again from our courts. As Justice Gorsuch has pointed out, quote, who would seriously entrust a handful of unelected, life-tenured lawyers like me to make predictive judgments about optimal social policy for the future in a very large country like ours? We, may, we may not always be happy with what Congress does, and there's certainly plenty to complain about. But as Justice Gorsuch rightly acknowledges, at least we have the opportunity to vote them out. And we can't do that with life-tenured judges. As we look at the accomplishments of the Trump administration and the Republican Congress, regardless of whether they're able to pass tax reform or if they can actually get their act together on health care reform. The most important long-term accomplishments of the Trump administration will be their impact on the judiciary, beginning with the confirmation of Justice Neil Gorsuch and continuing with Circuit Court of Appeals and District Court appointments that are now coming through the Senate. And it's critical, in my view, that the administration and the Republican-controlled Senate continue to push hard to appoint as many qualified 
judicial appointments as they can because let me just tell you the numbers of that were appointed when President Obama was in office in two terms. President Obama made two Supreme Court justices, 55 Court of Appeals, and 268 district court appointments. So that was quite an impact on the bench. So the President and the Republican Senate truly have an opportunity to protect our constitutional rights with qualified conservative appointments. And the administration, uh, I would say with, I know Ed Whelan's involved in this and others in this room, uh, but with uh, Don McGahn, who's the legal counsel for the president, uh, Mark Paoletta, who is the legal counsel for the vice president, and advice with, with advice with groups like the Federalist Society, they're making some excellent judicial appointments. And the good news is that the Trump administration is actually ahead of where the Obama administration was at this point uh, in their presidency when it comes to filling uh, vacant judicial positions. In fact, last week in the Senate, uh, they confirmed, uh, I believe, four new uh, Circuit Court of Appeals judges. Three of them are women, uh, incredible backgrounds, and one district court judge. <laughs> And I think you can expect that next week uh, there will actually be, as I understand it, four more uh, judges, five more nominations, one Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, four district court judges who will be reported out of the committee and then brought to the fore. One of them, actually, the, uh, the Circuit Court of Appeals position is uh, Greg Katzis in the DC Circuit, and he is brilliant. He's an, he's an excellent, smart, capable guy. Uh, I worked very close with him, closely with him during Justice Gorsuch's process, uh, and so I know he'll be, he'll be a great judge. Now, I think you're going to continue to see, unfortunately, that the Democrats are going to try to drag the process uh, and really run the clock out to make it harder for Republicans to get qualified nominees to the Senate for a vote uh, to the floor. Um, you have senators like Al Flank Franken who are using uh, what is a really a Senate courtesy called the blue slip to attempt to block qualified uh, nominees. Uh, what the blue slip is, is essentially in each state, uh, a senator is asked, will you give your blue slip to allow um, in terms of a, a nominee having consideration? But it's really been a Senate courtesy. In fact, just this morning, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Chairman Grassley, his staff issued a memo uh, on this blue slip issue, pointing out that uh, he's concerned that Democrats are misrepresenting the courtesy in an attempt to block judges from ever being considered before the committee, and that he, he plans to act in the tradition, you'll love this. He did the historical research of 100 years of the judicial, going back in the Judiciary Committee, and. Uh, he wants, he's going to be acting as Ted Kennedy and Joe Biden did um, and hold hearings on nominees even without both blue slips coming in if, if the senator involved clearly is just trying to be uh, being a, an obstructionist. So I think that's good news, very good news. So despite the good news, uh, the one thing that you can do as a senator is you can draw the time out. And I think that you'll continue to see the time drawn out on these nominations where they will run the full clock out on every nomination, even if it's one that's not controversial. And uh, so one thing I'm going to raise today is I hope, the, I hope the majority leader just says, if you want to run the time out, then I hope you like being in Washington for the weekend. Because I think uh, one thing about... <laughs> One thing I can tell you about being in the Senate is the minute you mention a weekend, people fold like cards. It's like a deck of cards. They go down immediately. So I can tell you the minute he says weekend, they won't actually be there for a weekend. People will be giving back time, and we'll get, we'll, we'll get, get a vote on, on the judicial uh, nominations. So it, where, I, where we leave all of this is I think this is an important issue for the country. We all understand the impact of the courts. This is an area where the administration has an important opportunity, 
and I hope they continue to work aggressively to, con to appoint qualified conservative uh, judges at every level of our court system. And I know that if we appoint more judges in the mold of Justice Scalia and his successor, Justice Gorsuch, uh, that that will make a difference for all of us in the rule of law. Regardless of how frustrated we may be at times, and maybe I'm just adding my personal viewpoints, uh, once in a while I have a few frustrations with the President's tweets, um, we can feel really good that Justice Gorsuch is a fitting successor to Justice Scalia and his incredible legacy on the court. In fact, many of you may know if you visited uh, Justice Gorsuch's chambers uh, that he has uh, Justice Scalia's Elk Leroy in his chambers. And Justice Gorsuch has said that he is delighted to share space with Leroy because it turns out that we share a lot in common. We're both native Coloradans. We both received a rather shocking summons to Washington, D.C. And neither of us is going to forget Justice Scalia. I think I can speak for everyone in the room. None of us will forget the legacy of Justice Scalia. And I look forward to seeing the legacy of a Justice Gorsuch. So I thank you for having me tonight, and I look forward to answering your questions. I'm still recovering. Come on. <laughs> you want to run a grassroots campaign for me in New Hampshire? I could use a thousand votes. Can you come up with them? <laughs> Senator Ayotte, thank you so much for coming out and speaking for the Buckley program. Um, first off, uh, my question for you is you mentioned you came from a family that wasn't as much for means, um, you didn't expect to have a political career. What played in your decision to serve and run for office as a woman and not coming from that type of background? What, what played for me is that, uh, like many things in life, we stumble into what we like to do. And I got out of law school. When I first got out of law school, I clerked for our state Supreme Court. And then I went to uh, private practice in New Hampshire probably our largest law firm, which isn't so large probably by other state standards. And I started, uh, I got involved in litigation there. And then one day, kind of chance, these things happen by chance, I uh, got an opportunity to work on a very big criminal defense case. And I spent three months, my first jury trial in federal court, and I was the junior lawyer on the case, and they gave me the DNA evidence to handle, because none of them wanted to deal with it. And so I got to learn DNA early on. I got to do my first Daubert hearing as a, a, a new lawyer. And then I realized I'm doing the wrong thing with my life. This is really exciting. And so I went and got a job. I knew about DNA, so I got a job with the state attorney general's office, took a pay cut, found a job that I loved. And that's actually what led me eventually to run for office because I, lo I realized that I, I loved serving. I love being a prosecutor, and then somehow I made my way up the chain, and I eventually became attorney general of our state. And then from there, I could see the bigger public policy implications of things that I did. And so I can't tell you that I had some grand plan, but I can tell you one thing, and that is find something that you care about to do. I'm not saying you're going to like every aspect of your job, but when you care about what you do, it's... You know, you can work hours and hours, and it doesn't, it doesn't feel like work. And even when it does, you know why you're doing it. And I think that's why I ended up running uh, for the Senate. It was sort of the path I had from the Attorney General's office. And, and it, it can be very rewarding. It can be also very frustrating and every other emotion under the sun. Uh, but that's where I ended up running. And by the way, I didn't know what I didn't know. When I ran for the Senate, it was my first run for elective office. I had never raised money before. I, sometimes it's good to know what you actually don't know and just do it. The 
thank you for the talk. Um, what do you think the biggest issues uh, for the courts will be for the next five years? The next five years? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. What, what would you say the top three issues the courts will be facing in the next five years? Huh. That's an interesting. Would be. So I, I think uh, obviously uh, the First Amendment uh, coming immediately is going to be the, the First Amendment issue on union dues. I think that's a very big issue uh, that that can have pretty broad implications in our country, not only for how unions are funded, but also I will have have a lot of political ripple to it too. Um, so I think that is coming down the pike. I also uh, think that we are going to ha continue to have more litigation around campaign finance and First Amendment issues there, if you were asking me to look out in the next five years. Uh, I think we'll continue to have lit litigation around the authority of Congress on legislation under the Commerce Clause. And I think, you know, what that is, depending on what the legislation is, um, if you gave me a five-year window, I would say that we're going to have some pre Supreme Court cases uh, around that issue. And I think now that Justice Gorsuch is on the court, we are going to have a Chevron case. <laughs> and uh, I think we're, we're going to, I think, see some action on the court about what does it mean in terms of administrative deference? And is that still the, the appropriate standard under, under both constitutional principles and also due process principles of whether that's the appropriate standard in terms of the courts giving deference to the, administrator, the administrative agency's interpretation of the law. So those are some of the issues I see. Oh, good. Did I pick some good issues, Adam? OK, good. I, I, I'll defer to Jonathan Turley for the real answer. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Sa Senator Ayotte. And my question was sort of the, to the dynamic of the Senate and a little right here, ma'am. OK, sorry, the light was. <laughs> All right, would you like me to move? I'll step over here. Is that better? Uh, no, I, no, I'm good. I'm good. I just didn't. All right, there it's good. <laughs> All right, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm used to like people blinding me. It's kind of like an interrogation, but it, it's. <laughs> It's usually either a town hall or an editorial board meeting. I don't so. intend to make this no, any more pressure than it is. <laughs> but uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the dynamic of the Senate, specifically in the context of Ben Sass's comments in his maiden speech on the floor on how the Senate floor is not being used in its traditional purpose for open debate and how that might factor into the confirmation of judi judicial nominees? Mm. Well, I, I think that Senator Sass, um, who, whom I know well and I have a lot of respect for, uh, his maiden speech really was, was a, a phenomenal maiden speech in terms of having people think about the operation of the Senate and, and bigger really broader principles. And so in terms of the Senate floor, I can't disagree with him that if you look at, I mean, if you look at the time, if, if I could do one thing, it would be really fun to go back and be a senator at the time of like a Daniel Webster or something when they really had debates. You know, when they would just, they would all be down there and they, they'd be in the mix, you know, and they'd have these long debates. Now what happens is that I'll go down and I'll give a speech and then no one will be there. There'll be an empty chamber. But I do have C-SPAN, so I've got that going for me. And then someone else will come down later and give a counter speech to what I have to do. It's not really a true traditional debate. And I would, you know, I, I think that Ben made a lot of good points of how, you know, what we've lost in the institution and what, what really needs to be returned to the institution. And I, I can't disagree with him on that. How would that play out in a Supreme Court nomination? Uh, I would say that the same thing happens with the Supreme Court nomination, unfortunately. It would be awesome to actually get down on the Senate floor and debate the merits of a Justice Neil Gorsuch uh, you know, with his critics uh, on the other side and actually have a real back and forth. Uh, but th that is not, unfortunately, traditionally what happens anymore. It happens once in a while, but it's very rare, unfortunately. And so I think even if we have another nomination, we probably won't see, we'll see one person talking to the 
to the media, and then the next group went. So we need Daniel Webster back. That would be fascinating. Hi, um, so two, but a, a bit of a two-part question. First, um, earlier in the panel, in one of the panel discussions, it came up that maybe say if the Democrats get control of all the um, branches in 2020, that they might push for expanding the Supreme Court to maybe more justices. Do you think that, given your experience in the Senate, that, there, that the Democrats there would actually pursue that? Mm -hmm. And the second part is, what do you think are the political, do you think it's politically bad that court stacking is sort of just the way that it goes nowadays? I, I think they'd have a hard time expanding the Supreme Court. I think that would be a tough political uh, goal to reach. So I, I would find that unlikely. Um, they'd have to make a pretty strong case and essentially you'd be back into the era where we're expanding it because we want a result. And that's hard even, even when the American people are behind you, that's a real hard one to explain to the American people. So I don't think that would happen. I do think we, we live in a world where, especially now that there is no, there in the Senate, there's no 60 vote threshold, that it is going to be whoever um, you know, really whoever wins the presidency and who controls the Senate that is going to determine, you know, the, the ideological kind of bent of who gets on the court. But that said, you know, there are a lot of examples, especially among Republican presidents, where Supreme Court justices were, of course, appointed and they didn't end up being, uh, you know, as conservative as you thought they were or of the philosophy that you thought they were. And uh, that's the one thing about a lifetime appointment that you know, when you put someone on a court for a lifetime appointment, even if you think by every measure that they're going to act in a certain way, there's always that variable and I think that will exist uh, no matter what. Now we're tending to put more judges on the court now with a circuit court of appeals background and that, that does tend to give you know, more measure uh, than, than some of these other situations that haven't looked the same, but um, so that I hope that answers some of your questions.